Well, we're back with our fourth class on the book of Revelation, and I hope in this time of social distancing while you're at home, you're able to study Scripture more than ever, you're growing in your faith, and my goal through these classes would be to take a book that's mystified so many and make sense of a very difficult book of the Bible. Let's just be honest, Revelation is not easy to understand. So tonight we're going to get through the end of chapter 1 and look ahead to chapter 2 and chapter 3. Uh, if you want to in the coming uh, days, you might want to read chapters 2 and 3 and get ready for the next session. And we're going to do kind of a thumbnail sketch of the letters to the churches of Asia Minor. We probably won't go for through every verse and every bit of those letters to those uh, seven churches, but we'll look at some of the highlights as we think about this book that was actually written to real people in real space and time. We've already talked about methods of interpretation. We've talked about the author of the book, the genre of literature, and some of the symbols that are found in this book. We've already touched on a few of those. And tonight, we're going to finish up chapter 1. So let's just get right to it. Let's look at chapter 1, verse 9. I, John, your brother and fellow partaker in the tribulation and kingdom, and perseverance which are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos, because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Now, we realize why John is in exile. He's in exile on Patmos, and we've already said that that was a very common thing for Romans to do. Political exiles was very common. So Patmos is a rocky island. Last week, we looked at the geography. It's really close to Asia Minor. It's not that far off the coast of Asia Minor. A rocky island, a desolate place, and he is in exile because of his testimony of Jesus Christ. But I want you to notice some things really quick theologically that come out in this verse. Three things we learn from this one verse. Number one, Jesus, or John, is in the tribulation. He's already in the tribulation. A lot of people make the tribulation something that's going to be in the future. Remember one method of interpretation was that there'd be a great tribulation, but the church would be raptured out before. Well, the church in the first century century would go through what's called a tribulation. The word here sometimes is referenced Uh, to the crushing of grapes. So it'd be something that would be horrible, be very difficult to go through, but the church will go through this tribulation. And then he talks about the kingdom. He's a partaker in the tribulation and the kingdom. Some people say that God's kingdom is something that's going to happen in the future, that God's kingdom has not yet come. But we know in the ministry of Jesus Christ that the kingdom of God comes in breaking into our world. So God's kingdom movement starts with the ministry of Jesus Christ and on the day of Pentecost you have the ministry of the Holy Spirit come and you see the expansion of God's kingdom here on this earth. So we bow the knee to King Jesus. If you remember in the book of Acts, uh, something very political uh, was that people made a charge against Christians and they would say these people are saying there's someone that's king other than Caesar. And so we know that our king is Jesus and we belong to his kingdom. But he's also in this perseverance. So three things, tribulation, kingdom, and perseverance. That John is calling Christians, and I would say John would call us today as Christians, to persevere through trial. So those three things are things that Christians should expect. We will all have tribulation at time. Now this happens to be a really great tribulation, but we're going to have hardships in our lives. That's just part of it. God's kingdom has come into this world, and we can be a part of God's kingdom. And then perseverance. God calls us to persevere to the very end. Now let's turn to the next two verses. Revelation chapter 1, verses 10 and 11. This is John speaking. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like the sound of a trumpet saying, Write in a book what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamum, to Thyatira, and to Sardis, and to Philadelphia and Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. Notice in verse 10, we're told what day this is. This is the Lord's day. Now, we just take that for granted that the Lord's day is Sunday. Now, we know from evidence in the early church fathers. Now, when I speak of the early church fathers, these are the guys that lived right after the apostles. So when the apostles died, there's people that came after them. One guy by the name of Ignatius would be one. You would have people like Tertullian, Cyprian of of Carthage, uh, many more early church fathers for the last or for the first maybe two or three hundred years of church history. These guys record a lot of things like how they read the Bible 
And we know early on the Lord's Day was known as Sunday. Sunday and the Lord's Day were synonymous. And that makes sense because if you think about Sunday, that would be the day that Christ was resurrected from the dead. So that is his day. So today we talk about Lord's Day worship. We just take that for granted. That's something that started back in the first century. It's very important for us to pause and think about this. John is in the Spirit on Sunday. He's being invited up into heaven. So he's having this heavenly first day, first day of the week experience, Lord's Day. This is going to be saturated. This book in particular is going to be saturated with worship and liturgical images. Liturgical or, or liturgy is just a high-tech word for organized worship. Think of the pomp and circumstance of the temple. That would be considered liturgy. Really, even in our churches, we have liturgy. Whether you've got a few songs and a prayer and, and the Lord's Supper, that's still liturgy. There's still a structure and a flow to your worship service. So Revelation is a book about liturgy. It's a book of worship. What does worship look like in heaven on the first day of the week? And that's what we're getting a picture of with John's Revelation. We see the use of trumpets here. And trumpets have three purposes in the Old Testament. They were used for judgment, where they were used as a call to worship, and they were also used in battle. So you've got those three things, judgment, worship, and battle. And in Revelation, we're going to see the use of, of trumpets in, in really all three of these ways. Now we have seven golden lampstands. Now if you think about it, the seven golden lampstands would make you think of a menorah. And when you think of Judaism, the symbol of Judaism, even today, you see the menorah, the seven lampstands. They're, they're like branches on a tree. So pause for just a minute and think about this. John is painting a liturgical picture. This is about worship in heaven. I cannot overemphasize that enough because so many people miss this when they're interpreting Revelation. And they need to understand because when you get into chapter 4 and chapter 5, it's going to make more sense of what's going on that this is a first day of the week Sunday worship service up in heaven. Now, as we think about this, this idea of a menorah, I just want to show you a picture of what a menorah looks like. Uh, you're going to see a slide where there's this seven-branch lampstand. And this is what would appear in the temple. And in the picture, you're going to see a high priest. Notice how the high priest is dressed. So you have this pomp and circumstance of the temple. You'd have a priest that would enter into the sanctuary and they would do the, the acts of service of Judaism. And one thing is they would light the menorah lamp. So that's a picture. I just want you to see a picture of menorah. You've seen these before. But what John may be envisioning here, okay? So with all that in mind, let's just go back and think about what he's told us in these two verses, okay? It's the first day of the week. Now he hears a loud voice like a trumpet. And we said there's three uses of trumpets in the Old Testament. He tells them to write down this revelation to send it to these seven churches. These are real locations that you can find on the map, real people that were living back in the first century. And so now he turns to see the voice, okay? So who is speaking to him? And this voice sounds like a trumpet, so it's majestic, it's powerful, okay? So let's look at the next few verses, uh, Revelation 1, 12 through 16. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the middle of the lampstands, I saw one like a son of man clothed in a robe reaching to the feet and girded across his chest with a golden sash. His head and his hair were white like white wool, like snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze when it's been made to glow in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of many waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a two-edged sword, a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in its strength. Now think for a minute back when you've seen people or witnessed people in Scripture that are luminescent. They're glowing with glory. We can't help but think when Moses goes on Mount Sinai and he has to wear a veil because his face is shining. He's been in God's glory. Heavenly glory is bright, is luminous, it glows. Remember Jesus at the transfiguration, he's glowing um, whiter than, than any fuller can make any garment of any kind. He is white. So in this case, Christ is glowing with glory, the glory of heaven. Now, weird stuff to us is 21st century Western Americans, but we have these seven golden lampstands. This is temple language. You have this guy dressed a certain way. And in the picture I showed you, the high priest dressed like this. So 
we're getting a picture that Jesus is the great high priest ministering up in heaven. So we've got the, the seven lamps. Now, here's where there's some departure from the menorah. In the menorah, as you saw in the picture, the, the seven lamps were connected to one stalk. But John is telling the reader there are seven separate lampstands, but they are all united by Christ. Christ is in the midst of the lampstands, and he unites all of them. I can't help but think of the story of the vine and the branches in John's gospel. He makes a reference to the Son of Man, Jesus being the Son of Man. This goes back to Daniel 7. And, and I would just say if you're reading Revelation 3, go back and read Daniel. There, there's a lot of images being borrowed by John from the book of Daniel. So in Daniel, we have the Son of Man who's being, being presented to the Ancient of Days. He goes up in victory, so that's the Son of Man image. And then Jesus is the great high priest. Think of the great high priest wearing uh, all of his, his garments, and it's a high royal or it's a high holy day, like the Day of Atonement when he goes into the temple. So this is the description of Jesus. Once again, temple type language. Now, what's really important to, to note, if you go back and look at places like Hebrews chapter 8, we're told that the temple and the tabernacle are a copy of what's in heaven. So as he, uh, as John is, is lifted up by the Spirit into heaven, he's invited into heaven and he sees what's happening, he is seeing the reality of heaven and tab the tabernacle and the temple were just copies of that reality. That's what John is seeing here in chapter 1. Now let's just read Daniel 10. And you'll notice in Dan Daniel 10, verses 5 through 6, you get a similar vision uh, of someone dressed like this. Daniel says this, I lifted my eyes and looked, and behold, there was a man, or a certain man, dressed in linen, whose waist was girded with a belt of pure gold of euphaz. His body also, like beryl, his face had the appearance of lightning. His eyes were like flaming torches. His arms and feet like uh, the gleam of polished bronze. And the sound of his words like the sound of a tumult. Um, say that word really quick, tumult. Uh, that's one we don't use every day. But you, you've got this voice that's just got power. It's like rushing water. I can't help but think uh, when I was a kid, we'd go canoe and my dad would take us uh, to the Sipsi River. And there was one part of Rapids called the 100-yard dash. And you would get really, to, to me in my small mind as a kid, it was like miles away. You could hear the water just roaring uh, as you come to it. But as you got closer to that rapid, your heart would start to race because you'd realize, okay, this is, this is going to be exciting, but it's also a little bit scary. But the power of, of water rushing, this is uh, the voice that John hears. So this two-edged sword that comes out of his mouth, we can't help but think of Isaiah 11, which talks about the Messiah will smite the earth with the rod of the breath of his mouth. There's this sword that will come, a sword of judgment. We know that God's word is like a sharp two-edged sword uh, that pierces us all the way through, that, that judges the very thoughts and intentions of our hearts. Then he's got seven stars, and that's strange to us. Why is he holding seven stars? Well, many commentators believe this is kind of a, a shot at the Roman emperor. There were coins uh, of the Roman emperor where he was holding seven stars in his hand, so possibly this is a shot being taken at the Roman emperor. We just don't know for sure. Uh, now let's go on to verses 17 through 18 of Romans 1. When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man, and he placed his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last and the living one. And I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and of Hades. Now this makes us think of Daniel 10. Remember Daniel uh, in Daniel uh, chapter 10, he is praying uh, that God would answer his prayer. God sends this heavenly messenger, and when Daniel sees him, he basically passes out. He falls on his face. So whenever human beings see heaven's glory, this is typically the reaction that we have, one of just complete awe, where we prostrate ourselves on the ground and realize we are not wor worthy. And we're told, don't be afraid. Jesus tells us the reason we're not to be afraid is he has the power over death. 1 Corinthians 15 tells us that he has defeated death by going into death. Christ trampled down death by dying. So Christ went into death first, and we can go into death knowing that Christ waits for us on the other, so other side. He has defeated death. He is the risen Savior. He is not dead anymore. Satan no longer has the power of death over us. The Roman Empire, their greatest power over the early church was, we will kill you. 
capitulate to us or we will kill you. And the early Christians said, you know what? Kill us because we know we have eternal life. You could go back and read uh, some interesting stories. I, I would say if you like to read ancient history, go back and read Irenaeus. Uh, Irenaeus uh, tells the story of martyrs. And, and one martyr story that I've always found fascinating is the story of what is called what people call uh, St. Blandina. And Blandina was a young girl that was killed for her faith. And the way Irenaeus tells the story, now Irenaeus is living 100 years or so after the apostles. Irenaeus says that, that Blandina was truly alive, even though they were killing her. She was truly alive, but the people in the arena were really the dead people. So to be truly alive is to be in Christ. So the early church had this radical vision of resurrection. They told the Romans, you know what? We'll die for our faith because we know we have eternal life. And so John is telling these people who are suffering persecution, Jesus has the power over death. He has the keys to death in Hades. Now let's turn to uh, verses 19 and 20. Therefore write the things which you have seen, and the things which are, and the things which will take place after these things. As for the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So once again, John is relating to uh, images and symbols. Now, we're going to get this in every... If you don't like images and symbols, you're just not going to like this book. Um, I will say this. We, uh, as Protestant Christians, if, if you want to call us Protestants, we have lost the idea of symbolism. And symbolism saturates the thought world of the early Christians. So we need to, to, to come back to that, that idea that symbolism is okay. Uh, understanding that the Bible is written in symbolic language that really points to real things. Symbolism shouldn't scare us as, as that some type of esoteric world that doesn't exist. They represent real things. We just have a hard time seeing that. But John is told to write about things which are. That would be the present state of affairs for the seven churches of Asia Minor. You're going to get that in chapters 2 through 3. It's like a personal letter from Jesus to each one of these churches. And that is thought-provoking. It's also disconcerting if you ask this question. What would Jesus say if he wrote a letter to our churches today? Well, in chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation, we get letters from Jesus to these churches. So the present situation, but also things that are to take place after these things. So future things in chapters 4 through 22. Now, I would give you a caveat and say chapters 4 and 5 are not really future events. They're happening right then. But we'll get some some idea of these future events that are going to roll forward as God judges uh, the people that have rejected uh, his son Jesus. These uh, images, though, I just want you to think for a second. These images show how tightly woven and intimate Christ's relationship is with the church. These churches are represented by these seven golden lampstands, and Jesus is walking through these lampstands. He is intimately involved. He knows what's going on in his churches. Realize that Jesus knows what's going on in your church. He knows intimate details of what's going on in your church. And when you're in a place of leadership in a church, that really, really humbles you to realize that ultimately you answer to Jesus and he knows what's going on in your church. He knows what's going on in your heart. Um, now let's talk about these angels, these angels of the seven churches. These stars are the angels of the seven churches. What does that mean? Well, we know in the Bible that angels had been represented by stars. We know that. There are three ways to interpret this. Let me just give you all three. Number one, some say these angels are real like guardian angels of these churches. They're, they're angels that are assigned to churches. So some would say that. Some would say these are messengers because the word angelos could also be used for messenger. So these are the messengers that carry the letters to the church. I tend to think, because of the research of people like James B. Jordan and Peter Lightheart that have really helped me with symbolism as I've grown in my own understanding of the Bible, that this represents the leadership of these churches. It could be one pastor leader. It could be a plurality of elders, whatever, uh, presbyters in each church. But these angels would be leaders of these churches. Now, why do I say that? Well, 
If you go back and look at the Old Testament, stars and celestial bodies represented governors and leaders. And it just really makes sense of the context that if Christ is going to write these letters to these churches, and he's going to hold these churches accountable, it would make sense that these leaders would be included in this message. So I hope chapter 1 has made sense to you. I know we've kind of gone slow, but we've laid the, the groundwork for the rest of this book. I hope it's really making sense so far what we've learned in chapter 1. John is receiving this revelation. He has been caught up into heaven on the first day of the week, and he's seen things that are just unimaginable. He's seeing a heavenly liturgy. He's seeing worship on the Lord's Day up in heaven. He's got a message he's going to give to these seven churches. It's going to be a message about things that are happening right now on the ground in these churches, but what's going to happen and what's to come. And he wants these people that are undergoing intense persecution to persevere, and he's going to give them reasons to persevere because worthy is the Lamb. Jesus will be victorious every time. Well, as I said earlier, as we started this class, you may want to read forward. We're going to be in chapters 2 and 3 next time. Uh, we're going to have that class coming out pretty soon, so uh, be on the lookout for that. We're going to try to keep rolling out these videos. Uh, what I would like to do once we start meeting again is these, these classes, the format's going to change. You're going to see me teaching in a classroom, but We'll still video, we'll still have the audio, we'll still produce these videos for people that, that are not members at Westgate where you can still get these classes. So don't despair. Uh, I want to finish this series out because I think it's so important for people to learn about this book. Well, God bless, and I hope to see you again next time with our fifth class session.